Welcome again to another edition of Digging Deeper. We're here with part two with Jeff and Shanti Felton. And um, as we continue this conversation on marriage, and uh, I'm your host, Jeff Norris, Senior Pastor of Perimeter Church, and this is a podcast of Perimeter. Uh, we're just really trying to help people dig deeper into topics that matter and that the Lord has a lot to say about himself. And on that topic there of God saying a lot about marriage, and, uh, you know, it was, it was it was really interesting in our in, in part one as we discussed uh, just some of the practicalities of some of the things that um, couples struggle with and deal with and some of the miscommunications and we're missing each other even though we're trying really hard and intentionality and all of those things. You brought up something, Shanti, that um, that really gets that cuts to the heart, which is it's not the only heart longing, it's not the only deep longing of of the heart for a woman. But it's the primary one, and that is, am I lovable? And then for the man, it's not the only one, certainly, but the primary one is, am I adequate? Am I able? Right? Well, you open the Bible, and in one of the first couple of pages of the Bible, you're going to see God create man and woman. And he's going to say that he made them in his image, which gives us a, a, a bit of an understanding that uh, to image God in the world, right? To and to reflect Him, to give an idea of what He's like. It's it's this beautiful combination of man and woman. It's not like the man fully images God, and it's not like the woman fully Im- images God. It's that when man and woman are together, right, in God's original design. Now, that's not that's. I'm not saying anything about people who aren't called to marriage. We're going to talk about that in another podcast about God calls people to singleness. And we all image God in our own, in in the way that we're designed. But there is something that God designed about marriage to image God more fully when man and woman are together. And when he is actually through Jesus, reversing the curse is what I call it. Mm -hmm. Right? Because what you have in Genesis 3 is when sin came into the world, he pronounces a curse upon man and upon woman and, and also the serpent, but he pronounces upon man and upon woman. And he says something really interesting. He tells the man that, or he tells the woman that your desire is going to be for the man, right? We finished the last episode talking about y'all's next project on intimacy. And I read that verse forever thinking that's what it was talking about. And I'm going, what's the problem here? How is that a curse? Her desire is always going to be for the man. This is, man, what a great curse, you know? And that's not at all what it means. Nope. Right? And then, you know, and what you see with a man is that you see as a result of the curse, the Adamic residue in the heart of man. So Adam's residue, which is, where was he when Eve took of the fruit? Yeah. He was with her and he did nothing. He was passive. He was complacent. He didn't take responsibility, even though God was the one who put him as the head of the garden and the head of the woman. All right. So all that set up to say then in the New Testament, you get to Ephesians 5 and the Apostle Paul, Holy Spirit speaking through him, says some things here that speak directly to those deep heart longings that we talked about in part one. Am I lovable and am I adequate? And so um, he says to the husbands, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church, who um, loved, uh, loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right. So we get an idea right there off the bat. What does it look like for husbands to love wives at that fundamentally deep root level of their greatest insecurity? It's to die to self, it's to sacrifice, it's to put her needs before your own, right? But then you get to the end of the passage, and it says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she, here it is, respects the husband, right? And Jeff, you were joking in the first, yeah, (laughs) Shanti kept saying, I respect you, I respect you, I respect you, which you're like, great, thank you, right? That doesn't quite hit the the emotional spot, but... So I, I give a long setup to say, I'd love to hear from you guys. As you have studied this passage, as, as you've done your research, as you've talked to countless number of couples, how is, how is God's word, how is the design of God 
speaking to these very core heart longings that we have in our marriages? You know, it's it's interesting. Over the last 18 years or so, we have interviewed and surveyed more than 40,000 men mm. and women and done these big, I know we talked in the part one, sort of the big surveys and all that kind of stuff. And we have seen consistently over and over and over the reason why I think why we are given that instruction mm. in Ephesians 5. Because if you look at it over and over in different ways, it's it's the longest passage on marriage in the Bible, right? right? Like there's, there's not actually that many passages on marriage mm. in the Bible. It's kind of interesting for something that's such a big deal. Right, yeah. <laughs> but And that's certainly the longest one. And over and over in different ways... God is telling husbands, love your wives, love your wives, love your wives as Christ loved the church. If you look at that whole big long passage, and then in parallel over and over in different ways, God is telling wives, respect your husbands, appreciate your husbands, defer mm-hmm. to your husbands, respect your husbands. And and he's he knows what our inner insecurities are. He knows all what we talked about last time that you know that men and women one of the things is these deep questions in the heart that is like a raw nerve. We don't yeah. realize that it's there and God does. <laughs> and yeah. so he's giving us this roadmap right. that will help us have the thriving marriage that we're longing for because it does come from that deep root. Yeah. of that question in our hearts. Yeah. And well you always say, I mean if you could unpack the you know, he tells husbands to love their wives. He doesn't tell them to He doesn't he he never says to wives in this big long passage. He never tells wives to love their husbands. Mm. There's you know, there's a couple other places where we're talking about, you know, the older women helping the younger women love their families well, but in this passage on marriage, it's almost like he's making a point yeah. that he never says, wives love, wives love your husbands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, that's, what I was going to say is that, you know, what do we do with that? As good biblical students, do we say, well, then therefore wives don't have to love their husbands? No, <laughs> you understand in the context, he is absolutely making a point as he is helping husbands realize that what I've called you to be is the head of the family and the head of your wives, which we'll get to in just a moment, is to mirror, we talk about this image image of God, this reflection of God, is to mirror how Jesus leads and loves his bride, the church. Yeah. Right? And so he's, he's, he's pressing that in to yeah. the husbands, who by nature now, because of that Adamic residue, that sin nature within them, we don't naturally tend to do that very well. We don't love sacrificially. We don't lead in a way that you know, that causes our wives to instinctively want to respect us. <laughs> right. Right. Or, or he doesn't tell us to respect our wives. Not that he says that's not important. Right. Just like but not loving your husband. It's is not the important. fact yeah. that because we are wired in a particular way, we'll do that. Naturally. Naturally. It was like when we, we did a, a, a day long conference uh, years and years and years ago. And at the end of the conference, a woman stood up in the audience during the Q&A time. And you should explain, we were speaking at the conference. We were speaking yes. at this conference. Yeah. And she said, look, I've been very careful to take notes when you talked about what the men should do and what the women should do. And she said, why is it, and she pointed this to Shanti, did you give the women all the hard stuff to do? <laughs> <laughs> and you gave all the men stuff that was really kind of just comes naturally. Yeah. And you see all the men in this huge room who had sat there from nine in the morning until five at night. You see them go, oh, like yeah. the oxygen got yeah. sucked out Everything of the room. Everything was deflated. Yeah. And, and what I told her is, look, it seems what we've told the men seems easy to you because it comes naturally to you. Mm. It doesn't come naturally to them necessarily. Yeah. Now, we probably should have said last time, let me say it explicitly this time, that obviously there's exceptions to this, oh, yeah. right? Totally. Like we're yeah. talking about like 75%. That means there's 25%, sure. but it doesn't, you know, the emotional sort of background is different. But the the issue is, is that it's going to seem like, well, honey, all you need to do is just take my hand when we're walking across the parking right. lot and I'm, you know, I'm yours. I'm like, and, and he's like, well, I love you like that, but I just don't think 
about right. that. Never comes, never but came it, to mind. But yep. it, it comes naturally to you. And same thing. He will naturally say, thanks so much for taking such good care of the kids. And it won't, it doesn't come naturally to me to like say the same thing to him. Yeah. And that, that kind of concept is basically what's being gotten at yeah. here in Ephesians 5. Totally. And it's speaking, God is speaking directly mm. to what happened in Genesis 3. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. And I, okay, I told you this when we got together and you and me and Jeff and another one of the pastors were sitting in your office and I told you about something that happens when I talk about this at my women's conferences, when I do women's events. Because if we're in a space, which isn't, it, this isn't like most women's conferences, because that's like, you know, there's like five speakers and I have 40 and a half minutes, like, right, you know, right. but if I have a retreat or if I get a chance to unpack some of the biblical theological Genesis stuff, one of the things I go back to is that incident in the garden. Mm -hmm. And I talk to the women about what is under the surface. And you can see that there are sinful tendencies that men tend to have. You see the sinful tendencies of men and you see the sinful tendencies of women. Yep. Where we as women, and I hate to say this out loud, I know I'm going to get in trouble, but it's just true. We have a tendency to want things the way we want them. Like everybody mm -hmm. does, but mm -hmm. we like want to control things. Mm -hmm. And so Eve is like- I'm over here going, mm-hmm. He's trying, he's, he's trying not to say that too loudly. Yes. <laughs> And but all over the world, like we've seen, we've studied, we've done studies. What was your website again, where people can send an email? <laughs> Shanti.com. Shanti. Okay, Thanks, great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, not to Jeff Norris. Yes, <laughs> um, but it, it it's accurate. We've been all over the world. We've seen this globally, all over the world, in every culture that we've studied. It's just amazing, but it makes sense mm. if this is a thing. Where you see what Eve did was like the serpent sort of convinced her God's holding out on you. You're missing something, mm -hmm. which is like you're terrified as a woman to be put in a box and missing something. And so she's like, we're going to do this. We're going to eat this fruit, even though we're not supposed to. And then you see the infl the, the uh, ten sinful tendency of men yeah. where, where was Adam? Like, and this is what I tell women in, in these sort of closed door environments. I basically say, look, what Adam's role was supposed to be, what he was called to do, he was put in charge of the planet, yeah, like yeah. naming all the animals. Like he was like king of the world, literally. Yeah. And he's this strong leader. And yet in the face of Eve saying, this is what we're going to do, he backs off. He's nowhere. Yeah. He should have, what he should have done is snatched the fruit out of her uh, out of her hand and chucked it back in the serpent's eye mm -hmm. and said stay away from my wife. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he should have done. Right. And yet he backs off. He's passive. And it's interesting when I share that example in a like a women's mm. retreat and I say what he should have done mm. was chucked it back at the serpent and said stay away from my wife all of a sudden there's this roar in the room because the women are like, yes, yeah. that's what we're longing right. to, for, to see is for him to actually step up yeah. to be that man that we know that he can be. And yet we keep pushing forward to try to control things and he keeps backing off. Yeah. And so that's yet another reason for some of the commands in the Bible. You know, I find it interesting too. And, um, it's, it's, but yeah, exactly everything you said. Um, take the fruit, throw it back in the face of the serpent, say, stay away from my wife. But it's also interesting that the very thing that the serpent was tempting Adam and Eve on was something that God had already made abundantly clear to Adam and Eve they already had. Mm. So he's, he, remember, if you'll remember the lie that he convinces them on is that if you eat of this fruit, you will be like God, right? Well, what did God already told him? I've made you in my image. In, in our likeness, we will make them male and female. Yeah. So there's that moment of going, you know, had they been thinking in such a way of, of putting God's design first, 
and and not buying the the huge lie that God's not for me and he has he hasn't written the best story he's for me to right he's something he's holding from me. something back yeah. from me right is is to be able to say what do you mean serpent we already are like God we're already made in his image what do you mean you? right so that's a a little little side note but to get back to your point what do you do well let me say this when women in the point of Ephesians 5 is when women are loved like that like you were talking about. Yeah. By husbands who are not loving them perfectly and never will. Only Jesus does that. But are loving them like that. Respect of their husband happens more instinctively, more voluntarily, right? Because what I would imagine you guys hear a lot, because I hear it a lot, is you want me to love her Mm. and or you want me to respect him? Yeah. Yeah. There's just no way, right? What do you, how do you counsel? What do you say when, you know, and how do you let Ephesians 5 speak to that, right? And in, in these real life situations, you know? I think uh, someone has to take the first step. If you're both not going to take it together, one of you has to say, I'm going to step out. I'm going to apply what Paul is saying here. And I'm going to love my wife. And I'm going to use these practical things. Mm. To, to show her that I love her. And oftentimes it's, it's that virtuous cycle that then kicks in. It might not be in the first week or month or even year mm. or longer. But I think what we've seen is that the other person wants to be the person that you're already saying that I am. Whether it's the husband saying, I love you, you're great, I love, you know, you're a great mom, I love what you do. She wants to be that in the same way for him if she's taking the first step and showing him how much she admires him, Mm -hmm. how much she respects him, how much she's behind him. All of that sort of stuff causes a guy to want to be that guy that she already thinks I am. Right. Right. Even if I'm not that yet. Even if I'm not that. And right. this is, I mean, and this is obviously, I think we need to say this out loud in sort of the moment that we're in today, in today's culture. This isn't saying that you can fix something that's very broken yeah. mm-hmm. in this way. Like one of the things that's heartbreaking is when, you know, I get an email from a woman who was in an abusive marriage and she says, you told me to respect my husband. So I just kept trying. Mm-hmm. I kept trying and mm-hmm. I just kept getting beat up more and more and more. And you, but you told me to respect him. It's like, uh, okay, there's a need for wisdom and there's a need for boundaries. Right. And there are situations where you're going to need to get counsel where the application of this, the truth is the same. God has wired us in these different ways. He's designed us in these ways. The application may be different. Um, But in general, what we're talking about is the vast majority of marriages where people just, they care about each other, right? They're just the average stupid human who doesn't, (laughs) who just doesn't realize they're hurting the other person's feelings or whatever. They're not being the person that you need, but doing these things will help them become the person that you need in most cases. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, it's so good. We haven't even talked about and, and won't dive into deeply here. Um, the first part of the passage in Ephesians where uh, wives are instructed to submit to their husbands. No, oh, you're going and, there. Yeah, well, you're going there. Well, not really. It's more of a teaser and then, and then saying, <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't have time. But I will say this. Uh, again, it all comes back to what, what Paul is doing there, what the Lord is doing there through Paul is to say, this is a picture of God and his church. Mm-hmm. This is a picture of Jesus and his bride. And he, and he does that throughout the passage. He, he, he actually comes back and says, this is a great mystery, and I'm talking about Christ and the church, yeah. mm-hmm. right? And, and so what, what do we have in this picture of Jesus and the church is we have, um, we have a bride who is very hard to love, very hard to love, a bride who is continually not responding well to the selfless, sacrificial love of the bridegroom. Um, and, and in, in his case with Christ and his bride, us, the church, the perfect love of her husband. 
And yet he continually pursues and he continually pursues yeah. and his love is tied to his leadership. And so he is leading in such a loving way that the, um, and, and I want to say this carefully because the world has so misdefined and, and misappropriated what submission means yeah, in agreed. this context of Ephesians 5. Totally. Right. We take worldly definitions of submission and bring them into this passage. And what God is saying is when you are loved and led by Jesus, the way that he loves and leads, the only desired response, the, the, the instinctive motivation says, I will gladly submit to that. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I will submit to him every day, all up for forever. He is so good. And he, what he's trying to do is really, not that the woman is off the hook here, right? But he's really, in my opinion, pressing in hard with the husband. He is saying, men, you are to love your wives as Christ loves the church. But, but, but you don't know my wife. She is so hard to love. Jesus goes, oh, believe me, I get it. <laughs> I know. Try loving you. Yep. <laughs> Try loving my bride. Right? But this is what I'm calling you to. And when you mirror me, when you image me in your marriage the way that I have loved you, your bride will begin to submit to your good leadership and respect you in ways that you've always longed for mm -hmm. because she is being loved in ways that she's always longed for. And those two deep level heart, heart longings that we talked about, right? Am I lovable and am I act, uh, adequate are suddenly being met in Jesus. Yeah. And so uh, this is the, that's the, that's the picture of Christian marriage that the world desperately needs, and sadly, that we have so poorly portrayed to, to, uh, to the world around us and even in our churches. I, I want to I bring this up again before we wrap up here. Um, uh, we did this at the end of the first uh, part with you guys. I want to do it again in case someone's listening and didn't hear that. We'll, we'll, we want to make sure that they hear this. First, get Jeff and Shanti's resources. These books that you see on the table, fantastic. They've written more than just this, but these are the ones uh, pertaining to specifically to marriage, for women only, for men only, the good news about marriage, and highly happy marriages. Make sure you pick up a copy of those. Um, but then also, y'all have a new project coming up, a new book coming out in February, correct? Yes, we so do. So tell them about that, and tell them about the, the, the opportunity that's available. You want me to do this, Of course, this, since I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can probably guess what the topic of the new book is. Yeah, we, we're actually, this is our latest research project. We're actually tackling the topic of intimacy in mm. marriage. And I, I would never have thought in a million years that I would have been doing this and talking about it publicly. But it, this is obviously a huge issue in marriage. I mean, yeah. this is one of the, the big things that causes arguments and conflict and heartache. And what we found in this research is that it doesn't have to, mm. is that there are actually some super simple things that make a big difference once you're aware of them yeah. and really overcome some obstacles in that area. And just, are, it's very encouraging, very simple, very encouraging. Uh, but we would love, and I appreciate the opportunity to invite the Perimeter family and anybody listening to this into the conversation on this, you know, this is a controversial topic today. Mm -hmm. The The culture hasn't made this easy to talk about. And there are groups of people right now who are trying to take down Christian marriage authors, unfortunately. And, you know, I'm sure I have not done everything perfectly by any stretch of the imagination, but Jeff and I have put so much work and effort into the research and we think it is very accurate and very biblical and very helpful. And so we would love anyone who's interested in being part of the launch team mm. to join us, to try to help get us into a good place in those first few months. It comes out in February. We're recruiting the launch team uh, this fall of 2022 um, because there we know that there's going to be, for example, review bombing. Mm. Um, that's a thing now. Um, when Christian marriage books come out is they recruit people to go on and do 
dozens or hundreds of one star reviews on Amazon or Goodreads mm-hmm. or whatever. And it's, you know, I'll be doing tons of radio interviews and it's hard when yeah. you've worked for three years on a book and people go to your Amazon page and see, oh my gosh, Shanti says what? Mm. And it's not true, right. <laughs> but that's, that's the reality that we're living in today mm. and um, kind of the cancel culture reality. Yeah. And so we would love to have uh, those who know us, who are passionate about marriage, who are interested in helping um, to be able to help us in the next in these next few months get ready well mm. for this launch. It's not going to be a ton of work. It's going to be simple things like putting reviews on or posting on social media or whatever. But if you're interested, we'd love your help. That's great. Where can they find you? How can they sign up? So if somebody want if somebody wants to put their hat in the ring, just go to shanti.com, s h a u n t i dot com, and click on the contact. Okay. I hope you'll do that. Hope you'll join their uh, launch team and help help them in this endeavor with such an important topic. It really is. A, a topic that, that, as we well know, the church has not always done a great job of addressing and, and dealing with in ways that uh, are ultimately helpful. So uh, I'm glad that you guys are tackling that. And we'll have you back <laughs> in February or March, and we'll talk about it. I would it. love that. It'd be great. So uh, thanks for being here with me. I love, I, I could pleasure, talk with John. you guys for two or three more hours, uh, Appreciate. but we're grateful for you and grateful for the work that you do. And uh, we're hopeful that you as the watcher and the listener have been blessed by this. And uh, we're praying as a church for the marriages in our church and just the marriages in general all around us. And so we pray and hope that you will experience and know God's, de- God's design for marriage. So thanks for joining us. Mm-hmm.